OK, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Vehicle Stabilization Kit in Action. We're going to go over this. It's going to take hopefully around about 20 to 30 minutes. Just going to give you an update on the refresher on the basic vehicle stabilization kit or standard vehicle stabilization kit. My name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the Paratech training manager. I'm here at the factory. I'll be doing some stuff in the back over the next few weeks, uh, doing some tricks of the trade and different things with uh, all the product we got here. Maybe something you've seen, something you haven't seen. You may have questions on that. But for today, we're just going to do the, the vehicle, the standard vehicle stabilization kit. It's first in a series of webinars based on kits founded in rescues. Uh, the standard vehicle stabilization kit is what we're going to do. Next one, we got the multi force, the rapid extrication kit, the highway vehicle stabilization kit, interstate motorway, hydrofusion, leading up to the biggest kit we do, the heavy vehicle stabilization kit, where we'll go more in depth with what's happening with uh, struts and bags and everything else that Paratech basically manufactures. Up and coming webinars. These are the up and coming webinars over the next few weeks. As you can see, uh, what I just discussed on the last slide is there, with exception to the last one, which is going to be the strut driver. These are all going to take around about maybe 30, 20 to 30 minutes, except with exceptions of the heavy vehicle extrication kit. That may take a little bit longer with about 45 minutes to, uh, to an hour to cover all points we need to cover with that. This is a PowerPoint presentation. It's for informational purposes only. It's not a substitute for hands on training taught by a qualified instructor. Reg regular hands on training is necessary to become proficient. Improper use of any equipment may cause serious injury or death. Think safe, act safe, be safe. Always lift an inch and support an inch. Reason that's in there is that some of the pictures you may see Whereas we did the pictures in the back in a controlled environment, like for instance, with the airbags, they may not have stabilization in. And if it's in a controlled environment, just so we can get these webinars out. Standard vehicle stabilization kit, the contents of the kit. We got two 25 to 36 inch Acme rescue struts, two 12 inch extensions, two 24 inch extensions, two 12 inch hinge base plate with anchoring, two multi heads, two tie down keys, and four 27 foot ratchet belts with ABS. I'm going to go over the, the components as the slides progress so you can see what I'm talking about when, for instance, you look at the bottom one, the ratchet belt with ABS, so you can understand what the ABS is. Acme rescue strut, 25 to 36 inches. Maximum load, 80,000 pound, up to four feet. That's with a one-to-one -one safety factor. The maximum working load is 20,000 pound with a four-to-one safety factor. We got two parallel Acme threads running down the internal threaded shaft that creates the strength we need to create with the locking collar. It's got four relief holes, in the actual tube itself that they are there for when air is attached to the strut the threaded shaft comes out once the the cup seal in the bottom hits the relief holds air will relieve and is that tells you that the strut is at max adjustment it cannot go any further yellow collar gives you two square square inches of surface area on the thread for strength so all the thread that goes through the collar, all the thread that's on the shaft, collar the threads make contact with each other, gives us two square inches of service area for strength. The collar then makes contact with the three inch tube. No gaps, no point loading. So all surface area transfers the load straight to ground. Designed for spanning shorter distances. 
That's the Acme Rescue Strut. It's available in five sizes, 12 to 15 inch, 19 to 25 inch, 25 to 36 inch, 37 to 58 inch, and 56 to 88 inch. It's got a pneumatic brass in, inlet nipple at the bottom. Basically, it says the bottom, but the struts can be used in any orientation. The only thing that tells me that that solid end is the bottom is the orientation of the label. If the label was around the other way, then the threaded shaft or the gold collar, the yellow collar would be the bottom. So it can be used in any configuration. The labels give, gives the capacities at different lengths in both two to one or four to one. These labels are new. On the older struts, it never had the, four, the two to one safety on there and it had a graph. These are actual numbers with two to one or four to one, like our, our longshore gold struts. It makes it easier to read. Again, it can be used in any orientation. Yellow stripes on the side, the two yellow stripes alongside the label, they give you the length of adjustment that's in that tube on the Acme thread. Also on those labels on both top and bottom, they've got angle lines on there. It's got a 45 degree and a 60 degree angle line. That's all that tells you that when it's leaning up against the vehicle, if those lines become totally vertical at 90 degrees, that's about the angle you've got on that strut. Helps you out with heavier loads. All pieces are hard coat anodized. There's no powder coat, so it's very tough for scratches and indentations on that. It works real well and cleanup is, is pretty easy with the struts. Again, extensions. We got four sizes of extensions, a six inch, a 12 inch, a 24 inch and a 36 inch. If you take a look at the new labels on the top of that extension, they're all color coded now with the actual sizes in there. It's got these ones have got the new lock pin which is a domed lock pin. It defaults to the lock position. So you don't have to turn it. You just pull the lock pin out and it defaults back to the lock position when it locks in. Always make sure that any component you attach to a strut or any base or head you attach to an extension or a strut, that it's locked in place. Make sure that lock pin makes the click, goes into the hole or into the groove. Rule of thumb extension with extensions. It's the one, two, three rule. Maximum of two extensions not to exceed three feet. Only goes on the solid end of the strut. Never put the extension on the threaded shaft. Reason being is if you happen to make contact with the hole on the threaded shaft and there is some adjustment there, the strength is purely relied on that lock pin. And that lock pin will shear around about 3,200 pound, 3,500 pound, in between that range there. If that happens, you're going to destroy the lock pin. You're going to mark up the threads. Threads are no big deal because you just you'll just file them back square, but you'll need a new lock pin which puts that extension out of service. When putting extensions together, no matter what configuration. It does not make a difference if the small extension goes on top of the bigger extension or the smaller extension goes on the bottom of the bigger extension. The thing that makes a difference is that it's got to go on the solid end of the strut. Hinge base. It's the 12 inch hinge base with, hinge base with anchor ring. It's got a 45 degree hinge cup with a dome lock pin. The anchor ring is rated for 5,000 pound capacity with a four to one safety factor. So it's a 20,000 pound anchor ring one to one. It's got an integrated handle in the base itself. It's got eight inch and a quarter holes for each side of the base to accept one inch pickets or rebar. It's got two 916 holes, just each side of the anchor ring nut. That accepts concrete anchors. Your Hilti concrete anchors will fit great in there. FDNY uses them a lot where they go in with a ram set, pin the base to the concrete, and you're good to go. 
It's got a diamond pattern on the underside of the base that digs into concrete and asphalt. It also digs to a certain extent into a painted floor. Only trouble is it'll mark up the painted floor. Multi-head. The multi-head's got five different ways to attach to the vehicle. It's got the V. Bear with me one second. There we go. It's got the V. It's got the 45 degree wedge that go up under the body of the rails. That's either side. It's got a point for digging into the sheet metal on each side. It's got a slot in the center that accepts a 3-8 chain. The other thing this head has got, it's got a hole going straight through the head. What that does, that was put in there for weight reduction. But like everything else, you find a use for the weight reduction for the hole. We can put a three quarter pin D-ring web shackle in that hole and use synthetic slings. Web shackle hangs down, synthet make sure you put the synthet synthetic sling on before you attach a shackle to the head. Then you've got the dome lock pin that defaults to the lock position. Ratchet belt. It's a two inch ratchet belt with a 27 foot long uh, tail with wire hooks at each end. It's got a, tw it's got a 12 inch static tail with a wire hook. It's got a ratchet with ABS. The ratchet belt is rated to 3,300 pounds, well, 3,330 capacity with a three to one safety factor. It's got a 10,000 pound braking strength. It's got reflective marks all the way down the, the, down the belt. Basically, the reflective marks, I don't know if you can see them, are there and there. The, the ABS, the ABS is on this part here. It's got two gears, whereas I can put my ratchet strap over the leading pin, then I can ratchet the, the, the ratchet belt down. Then I can bring it all the way over to release the belt. Always remember with, with ratchet belts, when you're using them, tie, lock the handle down in place in case of a trip hazard. Tie down keys. Tie down keys, got a large J, small J, a T key, a grab hook for 3 8 chain, and an oblong link. The capacity of the tie down keys is 5,400 pounds. All our tie down keys come with a load tag on there, so you can actually see the load, what they are rated for. Okay, the standard vehicle stabilization kit. And the kit itself allows you to stabilize up to 40,000 pounds with a four to one safety factor. That's adding all the struts together. It gives you, it gives you two complete legs ranging from 32 inches, that's with the strut, the head and the base, to 75 inches. And that's with a full complement of uh, extensions whether it be a three foot extension or a two foot or a one foot extension put together. Rescue strut multipliers. On light vehicles, we use 45 to 60 degrees. Why? Because there's not much weight there. 45 to 60 degrees, it stabilizes both vertical and horizontal road or lateral load. So it's always holding something. For your heavier vehicles, we go from 60 to 75 degrees. Reason being, because of that heavy weight, what we need to do is we need to, to concentrate more on the compression on the basis for the heavier vehicles. So if you take a look at the chart, on the chart, as you see there, you've got a 90 degree strut. strut. Basically, that's taking all the vertical load, so there is no compression load on that base pushing this way. The next one, we got the strut at 75 degrees. And the multiplier on that for compression is 0.28. So if you go with a 10,000 pound load on that strut, I've got 2,800 pound compression on the base. Now remember, 
If I go to strut each side, I've got 5,600 pounds of, sorry, of compression on both bases. So as my angles go down, if you take a look, drop it down to 45 degrees. If I've got a 45 degree strut on a heavy vehicle, going back with your same 10,000 pound, I got 10,000 pound vertical load. The compression on my base is one to one. I got 10,000 pound compression on that base. That's what this chart explains. It's all about compression on the base. So going back to my 10,000 pound, if I've got a 45 degree strut on a 10,000 pound load, and I'm using a ratchet strap, my ratchet strap is only rated for 3,300 pound. My grade 80 chain is only rated for 7,100 pound. My grade 100 chain is rated for 8,800 pound. Theoretically speaking, if I've got a strut each side of a truck and I got 10,000 pound load, I got 5,000 pound compression on each base, which gives me back to your 10,000 pound load. Basically, my ratchet strap, my grade 80 and my grade 100 has not got enough capacity to hold those bases from separating. Again, you've got, you've got your, your safety factors built in, but you don't really want to stretch your safety factors. So going with this, with your light vehicles, with your ratchet straps are fine. Going with your heavier vehicles, if you take your, your, your stabilization up to 60 to 75 degrees, again, at 60 degrees, you're at 0.58 of the load. So my base is at 10,000 pound, we'll see just over 5,000 pound of load, where my chains will work for holding the bases in from, for compression, whereas my ratchet straps won't. But there's always been talk out there with ratchet straps. Can I double them up to give me 6,600 pound? Yes, you can. You can double them up. But there's a big but with doubling up ratchet straps. If you don't keep the same pressure on both ratchet straps, then one ratchet strap is liable to see more load than the other, which may damage your ratchet strap. The ratchet strap may fail, put load onto the other ratchet strap and fail that one. So you've got to be very careful when you're doubling up ratchet straps. Assembly, <clears throat> always assemble the rescue struts away from the vehicle. Pick the correct size rescue strut and extensions if needed. What I tend to do is it works out pretty well as, an, as a, a guesstimate, I, I can say. I walk up to a vehicle and I when, I, when the 360 is done, I walk up and say, OK, this is where my strut head is going to be. I stand up against a mark out on my body, gives me a guesstimate. Then I add about a foot or two feet to that length. So if I got a four foot, a four foot mark where my head is going to be, then I'm going to need to run about a six foot strut if I want to put it to 45 degrees. I'll build it. I'll, I'll extend it to the six feet, bring it in. Walk it straight in and foot the base. Pick the correct base and head for the job. Again, for vehicle stabilization in this kit, you got a 12 inch base for the anchor ring. Always point the anchor ring towards the load you were stabilizing. That way it's easy to hook on the ratchet straps or the chains and tie down that base to the vehicle. Be sure the lock pins in, is engaged in the holes and the grooves of the rescue strap. OK, deployment, <clears throat> you're going to do your 360 of the object and take a look where you're going to stabilize on this. When you do your 360, try to carry a wedge in a 4x4 with you. That's going to be your primary stabilization for now. So as you're walking around, you can jam the, the wedge or the 4x4 in the A and the C post to stop the car from rolling over onto its roof. The only thing that stops that car from rolling over onto its roof is the side mirror. Your side mirror is acting like a wedge holding it up. So putting your primary stabilization at, at the A and C works while you figure out what's going to happen. Pick the spot where the struts need to be placed. Always choose the most likely side of the vehicle that poses the most danger to the patient. A car on its side, it's the cockpit. Why? Because that's what's going to roll over. It's not going to roll back the other way because the wheels stick out about 15 to 18 inches from the body of the car, creates a fulcrum, and the car's got to be lifted for it to roll that way. 
Whereas roof side, because your A post and your C post angles with, to your B post, it's that constant curve that, that wants the car to roll that way. Remember, when you put in stabilization into a vehicle, especially on the, on the cockpit side, you need to see about egress of getting in that vehicle and how the patient is coming out of that vehicle. So you never want to put your stabilization in the way of any extrication. If you're going to take the A post, the B post, the C post on top and fold the roof, you need to make sure you have room, not only to do that, so you, you don't have to move your, your stabilization, and you can get a backboard or anything else that you need to get in there to get that victim out safely. Walk your stabilization strut in, foot the base. Place the strut around about 90 degrees, perpendicular to that A-post on top. That way, it moves that base away from the windshield and it opens up that windshield if you need to take the windshield out and do your extrication through the windshield. Once in place, have someone, one of the guys, foot the base. That way, then you can place the ratchet strap and tie down keys and snug them up. You can repeat that on the other side of the vehicle. If you need to lift the object, if you need to lift the car, if an arm is trapped under the under the basically the, the door of the car, you need to lift that. Always make sure you, you leave as much adjustment in the stabilization struts as possible. That way, when you lift, that strut can be adjusted out and you don't have to do anything else to remove some. They put another extension on this, that and the other. So you tightened in. Now, if you take a look at the head placement, head placement of the middle picture, the head is right in the corner of that A post where it meets the fender. That's basically the strongest point of that car. With that head buried in there, the head's not going to slide down the A post and it's not going to slide across the fender because you've got that little hole that the connection is made by both uh, objects. The bottom picture shows the ratchet strap going onto the, the A post. Now, with this side of the vehicle, the cockpit side of the vehicle, it's going to be hard to put ratchet straps on where you can't tie them or put the cluster or the keys on anything substantial to create your V with the two ratchet belts. It's got to go to the underside of the car to do that. So what we what I've done here is I've just used one ratchet belt and the tie down hooks. I hook the large J into the A post as close to the mirror as I can. I bring it back to the base. Then by doing that, I tighten it in place. It still allows me to take the whole roof off if I need to without compromising any of my stabilization. There's some applications. On the top one, you see a tension buttress system. Basically, a tension buttress is you've got two opposing struts. You tighten up the ratchet belts that creates pressure on the struts, gives you a tension buttress. With that tension of part of the vehicle weight on those struts and the ratchet straps tightened up, that car is not going to move. It's not going to loosen up like it does with the wedges and the 4 by 4s that's going to be under your A post and your C post. Now with tension buttress and same side application, your rescue struts are going to be your primary stabilization now taking over from the wood. Car is not going to move. You can do your extrication, good to go. The other picture is same side tie back. You get this a lot if a car wraps itself around a tree where it's hard to do stabilization on there. Uh, you could do a controlled roll with this, but it's just placing both struts on the same side of the car. It's normally on the underside of the car where the wheels are, and you're going to use something to tie back. Come along winch of the truck or a grip hoist. Grip hoist works well because you can tighten it back as much as you need. Whereas a winch always got that, that extra turn before it stops. And a come along is great. You can use a come along. Only problems with come alongs, they're short, so you got to adapt that to the vehicle or just tie it back to the, to the vehicle itself. St stabilization of a semi landing gear. Now going back to the slide earlier, this is a 40,000 pound kit. It's capable of 40,000 pound up to four feet. That's with a four to one safety factor. So with these struts, we can stabilize heavy loads. The 
heavy loads are not just there for the long shores or the gold struts. For instance, if you see in the picture, the semi trailers are low to the ground, anywhere from three to five feet. The gray struts can stabilize these. The max load on that one van trailer there you see in the in the, the right hand picture, it's going to be around about max at 40,000 pounds. That's max. Am I securing the whole weight? No, I'm just securing some of the weight, maybe 20,000 pounds. So my struts can handle that. The bottom left hand picture, I've got a tension buttress on the back of the semi. That's a pup, that's a pup trailer. That pup trailer normally holds around about maybe 20,000 pound max. It's a freight trailer, so there's gonna be light loads in that. So I've got a I've got a tension buttress system on there. I've got an underwrite stabilized. I'm gonna prepare for a lift on that trailer and bring it up. Now, if you take a look of the ratchet strap base to base, I put a question mark behind that behind that uh, caption. Ratchet strap base to base question mark. Now, if I got a 20,000 pound trailer there, I'm going to be stabilizing close to 10,000 pound if it's at max. That one ratchet belt going through, if you take a look at that stretch, you, you can just about see it. It's around about 70 degrees. So it's going to give me around about 0.3 of the load at 70 degrees. So if I, if I got 10,000 pound there, I'm stabilizing 3,000 pound. Base, basically with that ratchet strap. I got 5,000 one side, 5,000 the other side. 0.3 of that load comes to around about 3,000 pounds. Is my ratchet strap good? Yes, it's good to that for that configuration, but it's getting close to its max. So I may want to configure something else with put a chain on there or doubling up my ratchet straps carefully. I put that picture in there so I can explain about the difference between chain and ratchet straps so you can actually see. Now, if those, if those struts would angle out a little bit further, which in anger they could be, that ratchet strap is not going to be capable to hold those bases in compression with that load. Strut maintenance and cleaning. Cleaning the rescue strut equipment can be done with soapy water and brush. You can use warm soapy water, it does not make a difference. You're not going to damage the strut or the seals. You can power wash the struts, but don't power wash the labels. The labels will come off with a power washer. Check the O-rings on the collar side, which you see is just an O-ring. That O-ring is a bumper. That's all it is. It got no effect of the operation of that strut. It just stops that collar from binding up to the collar with the four locating holes. If that O-ring is missing, don't take the strut out of service because you just get a new O-ring and put it in. It's only a bumper. The cup seal at the bottom. On the piston side, it's got a cup seal as you see. You see the little groove in the cup seal. That groove goes towards the base of the of the, the threaded uh, shaft. Basically, it goes to the end of that strut. Don't put that that cup to the thread. Put it the other way to the to the end. You've got to check that the cup seal is lubricated. If you're doing a, if you're doing your annual or your daily checks, make sure it's lubricated. Check the edge of the cup seal. Just run, run your finger around the edge of that cup seal. Check if it tears or gouges in that cup seal. If there's tears or gouges in there, you're not going to be, be able to put air in that strut. It's not going to function properly with the air system. And that's mainly for trench rescue. If you're not using any air on the struts, you don't intend to use any air on the struts, you've got no trench rescue capability, then just you can lube, this, lube the, the cup seal up and just put it back in the tube, you're good to go and use the struts manually. Replace as necessary. Now, we have used lithium grease in the past to lub lubricate these O-rings. Reason being is lithium grease is good in all temperatures, whether it be cold or hot. The problem is with lithium grease, it deteriorates the rubber on that cup seal. So if you're using lithium grease, you may want to choose, change that cup seal every two, three to five years. Check the cup seal. Check it's still it's still pretty hard. If it's not if it's not soft like jello. If it's soft like jello, you need to change it. Uh, and again, replace as necessary. 
you're going to use a loop. You're going to use a, a lubrication or a grease that works in the temperature you live in. Basically, it tells you the temperature on the end of the end of the on the tube or whatever grease you're using. You can use a general grease. That's fine. It's smelly. It's, it's got a weird color on it. It's thick. You can use that if it's good in the temperatures. Do not lubricate the acne threads. I know after washing the, the, the threaded shaft down, you may have a tendency you want to lube, lube the threads up because the nut's not running as, as good as it should. If you want to lubricate the threads, make sure the strut is dry, the threaded shaft is dry. Use a dry lube on the threads if you need to. A dry lube you can get anywhere, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, Menards, you name it, you can get it. Spray it on the threads, run the collar up and down, let it dry, you're good to go. Now, when you do maintenance on the threaded shaft as well, if you're checking the collars and everything, when you take the threaded shaft out of the tube, run the collar all the way down and run the collar all the way up. That checks for any, any slits, any gouges, any bobs, any sharps on, the, on the, the thread itself. If there is a sharp or a gouge, just file that thread flat and you're good to go. You don't need to send it into Paratech to file it flat because that's all that happens is they'll charge you, they'll file it flat and you get the strut back. That's just maintenance you can do in-house. The air inlet nipple, check the raised groove or the raised, raised, ed, raised end of the nipple for cuts and scuffs. You can just run your finger around there. We don't really have many problems with the nipples in the struts because they are recessed all the way. But something might get in a, a rock or something like that. Just check it. Check that the nipple is not loose. It takes an Allen wrench into the center of the nipple to tighten it up. Tighten it up and tight. Check that the nipple is not blocked. How would you do that? Pull the threaded shaft out. Push the threaded, threaded shaft down in the tube. Air will come out of the nipple. And that's one way to test the cup seal on the threaded shaft also, is you pull the threaded shaft out, put your thumb over the nipple, and push the threaded shaft down. It creates a vacuum in there that shows you if that the seal is good, there's no cuts or gouges in there. Lock pins, if it gets muddy, anything like that, you're gonna wash it down, wash it down thoroughly, then take the inside of the lock pin, spray a little bit of WD-40 in there around that pin, work the lock pin in and out, you're good to go with lubrication on that lock pin. Also, take a five inch, five inch wrench on the lock pin, pull the dome up, put the wrench on, make sure that lock pin's tight. If the lock pin is loose, take the lock pin out. You don't have to take it out all the way. Put a dab of red Loctite on there and tighten it back in. Beware not to over tighten. When, it, when you feel resistance to the lock pin is coming to the end, just give it a little tweak so it tightens up and you're good to go. Twelve inch base plate with anchor ring. Again, check the nuts on the side in case they are loose. We never have a problem with them coming loose because there's a lock washer on them. The thing you need to check is also is going back to the lock pin. What I said on the slide previous, check that for looseness and check, make sure it's lubricated. The other thing you need to check on that anchoring also is the hinge cup and the, and the anchoring. You see where the anchoring lays on the base. You see the two cutouts, they're pretty even on that anchoring. Check to make sure they're still even. If it's not, then you, you need to adjust that cup over and tighten it back up. How you do that is you take off those one of the nuts off that anchor ring, pull the, the shaft out, it disengages the cup, and you see a bolt on the inside. Place the anchor ring where you need to be, tighten that bolt up. There should be a lock nut on the other side you need to tighten up also. Put it all back together and you're good to go. Ratchet belt. You can wash the ratchet belt with warm soapy water. Check the, the belt for, for cuts and scuff on the edge. Hardest thing with ratchet belts is normally after a few uses of these ratchet belts, they're normally garbage. The reason I'm saying that is 
with 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 us, you know what it's like. We use uh, we use the ratchet belts a lot in training, and they do get scuffs on the edge, and cuts on the edge. The problem is with scuffs and cuts, it it reduces the strength of that ratchet belt. So you may want to take a look at the, the the cuts and scuffs. Use your common sense to to know when to replace that belt. Always check the wire hooks. Make sure they are stretched out. If, for instance, you are you have used that ratchet belt for maybe tying down a semi or something like that, tying down a load, and it's caught the end of the hook, not the, the full groove of the hook. You may have stretched that wire hook a little bit. Check that. If it is, again, that ratchet belt is most probably garbage. The ABS system, you can see it a little bit better on this picture. On the top, you've got the leading pin. If you bring the ratchet handle over that leading pin, it lets the belt out with the ABS system because of the two gears. Then the bottom slot you see goes all the way over to that, that one slot, which puts the rat, ratchet belt in neutral, which you just pull free. You need to lubricate those gears. Otherwise, you've all seen this in training or in anger. The ratchet belt's just been thrown in, in, the, in the cabinet of the vehicle or in the bag. You go to pull it out. You go to unwind the ratchet belt and it doesn't move. It's because those gears needs a little bit of lubrication on. I always carry a can of dry lube in there. And what happens is I spray those gears. I work the ratchet, pull it free. Normally works real well. Now on the ratchet belt itself, you'll see. Down the center of, a rat, of the ratchet belt, there's normally an orange squiggly line or there may be two lines that may be broke. That's a safety for the ratchet belt. If that line becomes loose, just like a bare thread, the ratchet belt is, has been compromised. It's gone over its safety factor. If the line becomes straight on some belts, like the, the ones that's like just a bunch of dashes in the belt, if you see solid, that belt, belt of seam over its 10,000 pound braking, ratchet belt is useless. You need to get rid of it and get a new one. Ratchet belts are pretty inexpensive. I change mine on a regular basis. Reason being is that we train with them a lot. And always the ratchet belts are first thing to go because everybody grabs it because it's such a versatile tool. One, for hooking the base to the vehicle with the struts. Two, for tying down the vehicle. Three, for marrying vehicles. Tying down suspensions. They do a lot of things with the, with the ratchet strap, so it tends to go fast. Follow up email from your local regional sales manager, manager. Ask any questions here. We'll still be open for a little bit after the, the, the webinar if you want to ask any questions. The regional managers are actually on the, the question and answer section now where you, you hopefully you've been using that and asking some questions. They are trying to get back to you as fast as they can. It's hard because our sales guys, our regional managers, they're out in the field, they're hands on guys. They are just not really hands on with a keyboard. So they do about maybe 100 words a, a day. Uh, they're not fast when they type in, so you have to bear with us with that. A link to the short video outlining the use of the system will be in the follow up email. There'll be a link in there to a quote section on a website, a link to a recording of this webinar. So remember, hi, hi, hi. I have not got the, the voice or the accent. I don't have an accent. It's this webinar and this computer that's giving me an accent. I talk, I can understand myself pretty good. So, but I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I hope you had a refresher from this uh, little PowerPoint we just did. Like I say, we, we try to do, we're doing one of these a week on the different kits. And we're also doing some uh, different videos that we're putting out there on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and all the media sites of different things. If you want to see something that you, you want to take a look at that, that didn't work for you, you can always reach out to us, reach out to, to your regional sales manager. He can walk you through it. When this COVID-19 thing is over, we can come out there and we can work with you guys. That's what we do best. 
That's the best way to learn. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this. The webinar is finished. Again, a follow up email will be sent to you. Please check out paratech.com. We got a new website up and running. Hopefully it's easier for you to use and you can walk through it a lot better. It's also a MaxiForce in action video on there. You'll see a lot of videos on the website. And again, my name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the training manager for Paratech. Again, thank you.